This is a test of the city of Palaka audio system.
Turn on. Red. Y'all ready? Don. Good evening. We'd like to welcome everyone to the city of Palatka, April 28th, 2022 commission meeting. At this time, we're gonna go ahead and call our meeting to order. We're gonna have our Pledge of Allegiance and invocation by Chaplain Alonzo Mulberry. Will everyone please stand at this time? Uh, Commissioner Jones, can you lead us in the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for your love, for your kindness, and certainly for the multitude of your tender mercy. God, here we are again in your presence. We stand as a needed people. We pray, God, that you would crown our heads with wisdom. Give us, Lord, what to do, how to do, and what to say when to say. We pray for your directions on tonight, God. We uh, come to do the business of the city. We pray, God, that there will be some hard decisions made at times and certainly some disappointments. We pray, God, that you will give us a favorable mind, God, to understand what needs to be done. We praise you even now. We pray, God, for unity. We pray for the spirit of peace that rest in the bond of the spirit. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chaplain. God bless you. Roll call, please. Commissioner Tammy McCaskill. Here. Commissioner Will Jones. Present. Commissioner Justin Campbell. Present. Commissioner Rufus Borum. Present. Mayor Terrell Hill. Here. We have a quorum, sir. No, members are accounted for the record. Thank you. Next up is approval of minutes from the April 7th special call meeting as well. I'll take all of these cumulatively. Items A, B, and C, uh, the April 7th special call meeting, the Joint City Commission meeting on April, and County Commission meeting on April 7th as well, and the City Commission meeting on April 14th. Motion to approve the minutes as they are printed, A through C. Okay. There's a motion to approve item 2A through C. There's a second by Commissioner Jones. Is there any further discussion? Seeing, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Proposed motion carries unanimously. Moving on to public recognitions and presentations. This is our April 2022. The school year is almost over. Wow. <laughs> Student of the month presentation. Up with me this month. I get the luxury of picking. So... Commissioner McCaskill, you're with me for student of the month. Give us some words before we get started. Just want to encourage all the students to keep up the good and hard work that you're doing. You, we are proud, super proud of you all. And just congratulations. You were chosen among many. Thank you very much. So now we'll get ready for our student of the month. And I know sometimes we'll end up with students who come in person. Uh, and so we want to make sure we recognize you if you're here and you're present today. This is our virtual student of the month for the month of April 2022. And our students are as follows. From Browning Pierce Elementary School, Chloe Vincent. From Children's Reading Center Charter School, Leanna Longi. From Hillcrest Academy, Gavin Timberlake. From James A. Long Elementary, Summer Sullivan. From Kelly Smith Elementary, Tanner Millison. From 
Um, Mellon Learning Center Pre-K, Ella Rogers. From Pre-K at Mellon Learning Center, Caden Jenkins. And from William D. Mosley Elementary, Malavet and Dino De Leon. I didn't think I'd get that, did you, Commissioner? Palak uh, Junior Senior High School, it still sounds funny. Brandon Lewis. From Pennau Baptist Academy, Caitlin Hutchins. From Putnam Academy of Arts and Sciences, Kalia Carruthers. Kyla. Did I say it right? Kyla, come up, Kyla. I see you're here. I messed your name up. Come on, Kyla, you got to come up so they can see you. This is what happens when I butcher your name. You thought he had it right. I, I, listen, I thought I was doing good. <laughs> Let's give her another round. From Putnam Edge High School, Jalen Johnson. And before we conclude our student of the month, we wanna make sure that we also say thank you to the educators who are assembled in Zoom land all around who are watching the presentation. Oftentimes they never get enough thank yous for the sacrifices that they make for our children. We just want to take this time out to thank all of our educators. And if we have any in the audience, would you please stand at this time? Let's give a round of applause to our educators. Also, let's give a round of applause to our family and extended friends and neighbors who all have worked very hard to raise these children and to be positive influences in their lives because it truly takes a village to raise a child. So all parents who are present in the audience as well as those who are assembled around the room at this time, take a bow and we wanna say thank you to stand for us so that we can say thank you for the work that you've done with your children. And so, as I always say, when we do our student of the month program, um, something that I learned back in the third grade with Ms. Thomasina Green, uh, we started every day out by simply saying, I am somebody. If my mind can conceive it and my heart can believe it, I know I can achieve it because I am somebody. You're somebody special, somebody great. You're destined for greatness. And don't ever take that for granted. And we are so proud of all of our students and the work that you've done. And so, Continue to be the leaders that you are, and we look forward to you being the leaders of tomorrow and sitting in the seats that we're in and leading this community to the next level. So again, thank you very much to all of our students, and we are so proud. And I want to make sure that while I've got the students in here, class of 1976, so y'all just stand for me for one quick second. Central Academy class of 1976. These classmates are always around. They're giving back to the community. And so we just wanna make sure that we continually thank them because we look forward to our students doing exactly what the class of 1976 is doing and will continue to do. And that's always loving Palaka and giving back to the community. So again, let's give them a round of applause. Next recognition, recognition of graduates of the Leadership Academy inaugural class. Mr. Holmes, I'll turn it over to you at this time. As all of you are aware, um, a few months ago, we uh, undertook to uh, engage in a Leadership Academy uh, which was the first that has ever been held at the city of Palatka. And uh, through a uh, suggestion of actually Ms. Shank, who has some knowledge of, uh, of the instructor that uh, we ultimately chose and his reputation, we ended up 
collecting and engaging Dr. Joseph Faviat to come in and lead our class. Um, when <clears throat> Ms. Shank first mentioned his name to me, I was not familiar with him. And, uh, you know, over time, you, uh, you get a lot of suggestions of a lot of people who are, uh, you're, you're advised are uh, stars in their profession and you tend to adopt a certain level of skepticism about that. The more, <laughs> the older you get and the more you do these sorts of things. But when I looked online and started reading something about Dr. Smaviak, I was pleasantly surprised at how, how impressive his credentials were. And so we engaged with him. We spoke with him on the phone once or twice and then engaged with him to come over and, uh, and speak with us. And little did I know it would be an experience that would turn out to be far more beneficial, far more impressive, and I think far more constructive for the city of Palacca than I had ever envisioned when we began the process. Uh, I think that everyone who attended the class and participated in the class took something out of the class. I did personally. Uh, I think, and everyone that I spoke with in the class indicated they did as well. Real tools that you can apply in your job, in your life, uh, just in general. And uh, the classes were always engaging. You've all had instructors in classes and Sometimes they went through the motions and you got a little bit out of the class and you just checked off the box and you got your thing done. Well, that was not the case with Dr. Saviak's classes. People who, who I never expected to see engaging in the class at the level they did from our employees engaged in the class. And, and it was really rewarding to watch our, our employees basically adopt what was being presented and you could see the lights come on so many times. So without any further uh, introduction, I'd like to introduce Dr. Savi. I can let him make a few comments and then we'd like to recognize the, the, the students from the class who actually participated and graduated. Okay, Dr. Savi. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. I, I wanna first commend the mayor and the city commission and Mr. Holmes for um, focusing on uh, what is a really, what should be a really important priority for every organization in America. Uh, and that is making sure the current leaders are performing at their best and growing our future leaders uh, to ensure that excellence is always our single standard. The uh, program uh, involves several different assignments. It is rigorous and intensive. We have lots of class discussions about real world challenges and how to apply best practices and tools that will uh, produce success in dealing with them. Uh, they sharpen a number of the key skills that effective leaders uh, need to uh, utilize every day, you know, research, presentation, problem solving, analysis, uh, teamwork. Uh, and they also deepen their knowledge of key subjects, human resources, budgeting, uh, policy, uh, successful communications. Uh, once again, all designed to ensure that they are um, providing the highest level of service to your community. And, and the, the, ultimately, the, the beneficiaries of a program like this are your citizens. And, and they uh, will be continually served by individuals uh, who um, are able to utilize best practices, who are uh, the best leaders uh, that your citizens deserve, and who are doing everything they can every day to ensure that the government that serves this community is being provided to them as in, in the most effective and efficient and equitable manner uh, possible. And uh, it was a joy, an honor, and a source of pride to teach this class. You have individuals who are highly motivated, uh, they're dedicated, they're hardworking, they're proactive problem solvers, they're innovative, and they have a genuine love for this community. And I'm always available to them anytime they need to call or contact me uh, for any support, ideas, assistance. Um, but once again, I, I really uh, I credit the city for uh, your leadership and your commitment to ensuring that your city government has uh, leaders who are uh, providing uh, the, the type of leadership that you want for your city 
uh, so that citizens get the very best at everything that they uh, they they interact uh, with city government on and that they receive uh, through city services and city programs. And so thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm, I'm grateful for it, really enjoyed it. Very proud of this class. Uh, the future is very bright for the city of Blackville. Thank you, um, just before Dr. Sabiak comes forward with the presentations, there's a quick video, Doc, just before we get started. And that is not Toby Williams at the beginning of this video. Hi, I'm here with Chief Shaw. Chief Shaw, please tell us what the Leadership Academy means to you. The Leadership Academy uh, put on by the city of Palaka was uh, very uh, informational. It, it provided me with a uh, look inside uh, to see what I've learned uh, over my time in, in uh, administration and uh, the experiences I received through other leadership training classes. Um, you would think that um, some of this stuff is just repetitive, but it wasn't. Uh, we were able to, to look inside, find out what we were doing right, uh, where we could get better. Um, we were able to take tools uh, from the uh, academy and put them in our tool belts and it made us better leaders and take back to our own departments to continue to make not only the, the department better, but the city of Palaka better. I really enjoyed it, got a lot from it, and uh, I'm glad I was able to participate in it. The Leadership Academy has allowed me to learn more about myself and my colleagues. It has allowed me to learn best, best practices to enable and grow the ideal leader. And it also has allowed me to become familiar with leadership re resources. The opportunities are endless. The City of Palaka Leadership Academy means having the opportunity to grow. City leadership identified you as someone who can influence others. The leadership trainer will help you hone your ability of influence. Together, we are the future of our community, and I hope that fellow staff members will attend this great academy. I'm Eli Hagenbotham. I work for the City of Palaka Public Works. It was an honor to be chosen for the leadership training. When I started this training, I knew very little about being a good leader. Now, I have the tools to become a great leader. Three. Leadership Academy is creating a culture in our organization to train and prepare our supervisors to be successful. This class made me reflect not only on myself, but also my peers and my supervisors too. Successful leaders have self-awareness, which means that you not only reflect on yourself, but everybody around you. Over the 12 weeks, we learned about various things like active listening, how to cultivate great communication skills, collaboration, emotional intelligence, and showing empathy to your employees, and also encouraging innovation. My favorite was doing the presentations with the 21 laws and seeing what everyone learned and the different interactions we had. Each law had a takeaway and it was amazing to watch all of us learn and grow at the same time. Now the only thing left to do is go out and do great things. And as Dr. Saviak would say, bravo, we did it. Hi, I'm here with Justin Bridges. Justin Bridges, what does the Leadership Academy mean to you? Leadership Academy to me meant um, being able to grow within the community, also within the city, and uh, helping improve the future with our city um, to bring younger people in as, as older ones move mm -hmm. out. And uh, I think that's it. Speaking on the Leadership Academy, I'd like to say I have two main takeaways. Uh, number one was acknowledgement of the things I'm doing correctly as a supervisor. Secondly, is a reminder of some of the things I could be doing better as a supervisor. I appreciate the city and Dr. Sabiak for conducting this course. Um, it was well worth the time, and I appreciate y'all. A little snippet of what the Leadership Academy meant to me. The Leadership Academy meant to me, uh, I learned a lot of things I need to work on, and it gave me a lot of insight on what to need to do to be an effective leader. Uh, I think it's a very wonderful program that the city has offered to the staff, and I hope they continue to do it. The instructor was very open and clear in his direction.
directions and gave me opportunity to express my concerns and opinions about life itself and also just give me some education on how to move forward as a leader. So me saying this, I support this program and y'all continue. Sink. He was sinking. Dr. Saviat, floor is all yours. Recognizing your hard work, uh, your success, your dedication, and uh, your leadership. Uh, and this was not easy because you all have full time jobs, you have families, and community responsibilities. Uh, but all of you gave a lot to this, and um, that's the job it is. So I'm going to call uh, each of your, your names, and then the mayor and Mr. Mr. Holmes will be presenting you uh, with your uh, diploma, and you will officially graduate the City of Plaquemines 2022 Leadership Academy. Uh, the first one is Mr. Don Holmes. <laughs> By the way, that sent a good message to have the city manager in the leadership academy. It takes a wall. <laughs> Mr. Eddie Cutright. <laughs> Chief Jason Shaw. Captain Toby Williams. We were finally kind of able to get him out of his shell by having him speak in this program. Kind of an introverted, quiet individual. Who? Who? Yeah. Who? Yeah. I told my people a lot of progress. He just fooled you. He was just learning. He was just trying to listen and learn. He gave it. <laughs> Christopher Taylor. Uh -huh. I, I love that y'all did the shirts. Miss Sunny Cramps. Uh -huh. <laughs> Director Lauren Chang. <laughs> Adapt, overcome. Congratulations. Miss Ann Atkins. Mm -hmm. 
hit down. Um, Jackie Pappas. We're going to get one. Justin Bridges. Director Virginia Jones. <laughs> Tim Wiley. Brian McCann. Moors, <laughs> Eli Higginbotham. Closing out, Director Jonathan Griffin. I think they did a, a group shot with all the graduates and their certificates. That's no. No, he don't. He gonna block us. <laughs> Cheese. Cheese. <laughs> okay, super. No problem. Thank you. Once again, congratulations. We are especially proud of you and very much looking forward to seeing all your continued success in the future. Yeah, I got one question. Did they um, attend? Everybody attended the class. No, no misses. Yeah, once when they were, yeah, it was a significant contest. Yeah, but no, they had a really good class attendance and uh, love doing it in the venue that we were in. Yes, sir. So we've got one more presentation, Doc. Doc, we got one more presentation. So if you could just stand right there for us. Um, You've kind of heard a little bit from the city manager, but Dr. Saviaki is by far um, an asset for us as it relates to the Leadership Academy. And we also had an opportunity to walk into uh, many presentations with the Florida League of Cities and just watch how powerful um, of a presenter and an educator he is uh, for the league as a whole and throughout the state of Florida in this country. 
And so it was definitely a privilege for Palatka to have such a powerhouse lead our leaders. And so we are just absolutely delightful and we're looking forward to the Leadership Academy becoming an annual portion of what takes place in the city of Palatka. And we have a special presentation which says, presented to Dr. Joseph Sabiak in appreciation of your instruction of the inaugural City of Palatka Leadership Academy presented this 28th day of April, 2022 by the Palatka City Commission. And we wanted to make sure that we also presented you with a city pin as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get right here again. And before we move into our next recognition, I want to bring up the class of 1976. If you would come forward at this time uh, for some special comments. <laughs> 76 strong, right? I'm not a speaker, mm -hmm. but I have been designated by our class group and the um, to Mayor Hill and the City Commission, Miss Commissioner. We were like, I'm here to thank you and give you a little bit about the 76 Scrum. It's not all the class of 76, but it's a group of classmates that have come together to give back to our community on the north side, Putnam, anywhere that we can be of help. We are giving scholarships on um, December, I mean, no, no, it was November, we did a coat, coat drive. And we are here to thank the city of Palatka for being so diligent about supporting the class of 76 in all that we do. We are over what, the two events that we had, the Farm Fresh, and the um, coat drive was given over, was held, I'm sorry, at the um, Jenkins old Gymnasium. Jenkins um, Middle School Gymnasium. Um, gymna gymnasium, thank you. Gymnasium. And it was just an awesome success. And we um, third over 200 and 50 cards, 550 families. So we would just like to thank so much the city, the club writers, <laughs> I forgot his kid's name, because I'm not a speaker. You see, I, yeah, I'm trimming in the voice. You're doing pretty I'm good. Not. You're doing pretty good though. Mr. Court Wright and Courtney James. Awesome, awesome person. Anything that we needed, Courtney was there for us. It was such a positive and awesome experience with Courtney as he set, helped us set up tables, got anything that we need. Even he had to leave, we had to call him back within minutes. Courtney was there to give us what we needed. This Farm Fresh, um, event was even telecast on the news and it was such an awesome turnout 
And we would just like to thank the city of Palatka, Mayor Hill, and the commissioners for all the support that they give the class of 76. And truly, we are still being the community doing great things. And we would still like your support. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And oh, we know fails. <laughs> thank you. We thank y'all. And, and, and just for clarification, the class of 76 doesn't just do a Coke drive. They give hundreds of Cokes to children in Palatka. And then they give hundreds more to kids in East Palatka. They do more than a Coke drive. They have a real event that serves many, many people in this community. And we just appreciate you guys so much for the work that you do. And again, just thank you for being a shining example of what Palatkans are. So again, thank you. Next up is a recognition, of somebody we're very familiar with for completion of his FLC University Leadership Academy. Um, person is always given direction. <laughs> Man of great detail. FLC University Leadership Academy 1, Certificate of Completion, March 11 through 12, 2022, Kissimmee, Florida, presented to Rufus J. Borum, Commissioner, City of Palatka. Job well done, Commissioner. Continue to ascend to the highest rank, and we are so proud of you. Well, first of all, I just want to thank the city of Palatka for this honor and also the FLC city, uh, FL for legal cities for this honor. Uh, again, I'm always trying to improve myself, whether it's personally, professionally, or politically. When you stop learning, you, um, you, you start dying. So Life is a uh, education is a lifelong experience, and I'm going to continue to do what I can to continue to help uh, move my city forward and help continue to improve myself personally. So, thank you guys for all of your support. We got that. I know Commissioner McCaskill has already completed this training as well. So, but again, we like to um, make sure that we, we I, I guess, attend these um, particular trainings because it really help you in so many different ways that open up, it gives you different dimensions of yourself and others. And so people that you work with uh, on a daily basis or periodically, uh, it will help you understand how you guys, your chemistry work together or not. And there's several different things that categories that they use in terms of um, learning who you are as when they built the profile they, they did a pre-survey uh, prior to the class. And basically what that built your profile prior to getting to the class. And once you got in the class, you were able to sit with um, people who were like you per category. And they had a couple of categories they had expressed and wanted. That, that was um, two different factors. And then they had inclusion, control, and affection. So. You either had express inclusion, express control, express uh, affection, wanted inclusion, wanted control, or wanted uh, uh, affection. But again, these are the different things that they kind of 
uh, I guess, build your profile on and you have me, me, high, medium, low uh, categories. So, but again, I, I, I would like for everybody to, to at least try and participate in that. And it was a final B uh, evaluation. So thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to share that. Thank you. And also, thank you, Commissioner McCaskill, as well. Next up is Employee of the Month Award in the spotlight. It's Jones. Okay, so this month, and we have, since we started this, it has really proven to be very positive um, with our employees. This month, we had four nominees, and our chosen nominee was David Green. Ready to speak tonight. <laughs> uh, Mr. Green, uh, we started this together back in uh, 2020, December 2020. It was two, myself, Dave, and Aaron, we was two, three, really uneducated code and code uh, But Mr. Green took the, took the bull by the horn, I guess you could say, and, and ran with it. And through code enforcement classes and education and on the job training, he has came to be one of the, the greatest code enforcement officer I've seen in my life because he has a way of having people be nice to him when he also serving them with violations. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that before in my life, but Mr. Green is an awesome, awesome employee and I hope I can get two or three more like him and with his help and his guidance, I think we're gonna turn this city to the way it needs to be. All right. Mr. Green. Thank you. <laughs> And our sponsor for the employee of the month is Two Sisters LLC. All right. Don and also your, your, your director, I mean, if y'all go up there, it looks, looks really good. Yes. <laughs> That's a nice, nice gift, Dave. If you don't want it, ain't he? you know, David moved over from another one of our departments to take on this job. Wow, uh, he had no experience, no training. He and Eddie both uh, went to school, became certified. And uh, if any of you have any idea of how difficult it is to be a code enforcement officer, you understand what a great job he's doing because of the fact that you aren't getting more complaints. Right. I mean, doing the, it's hard to make anybody happy as a code enforcement officer. And the fact that he's been as effective as he has um, and, and seems to keep a, a good rapport with the people, our citizens, I think that's a testament to, to the job he's doing. So I wanna also express my appreciation. Yes, it's slightly tougher than being the mayor and the commissioners. <laughs> Hey, next up, it's a proclamation for International Firefighters Day, May 4th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The proclamation reads as follows. Whereas hundreds of dedicated and selfless firefighters in our community provide vital and life-saving services to the citizens of their communities, at a moment's notice, these men and women risk their lives by subduing fires and rescuing those trapped in infernos as well as saving citizens from emergencies that could have been deadly situations. And whereas International Firefighters Day is observed on May 4th annually to remember our firefighters who paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect our safety and to show our support and appreciation to firefighters throughout the community who continue to protect us throughout the year. And whereas the loss of life or property by fire can cause our citizens and community a great sense of grief, Firefighters are always available to protect our citizens from structure fires, vehicle fires, and property fires that affect all segments of our society. And whereas firefighters assist law enforcement and emergency personnel to control hazardous situations and provide excellent medical care, 
and whereas firefighters contribute significantly to the continued well-being of the city of Polanka through their outstanding commitment to community service. Now, therefore, I, Tangalow Hill, Mayor of the City of Palaka, together with the members of the Palaka City Commission, do hereby proclaim May the 4th, 2022, as International Firefighters Day in the City of Palaka. And we call upon our citizens to respect and honor the work of our dedicated firefighters who protect and serve us all. And with this word, I have here and to set my hand and cause to be fixed the official seal of the City of Palaka, this 28th day of April, in the year of our Lord, 2022. So moved. So moved to the floor and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries unanimously. Let's give a round up. We well, just wanted to thank everyone for recognizing the uh, sacrifice of the firefighters and their families. Uh, firefighting is a dangerous job, as you guys are aware. Uh, there are many women, men and women across the world who participate in this uh, occupation. And I would just like to ask that you keep uh, our firefighters, our local firefighters in Putnam County and Palaka, in your prayers as we move forward and thank you for everything. Mm -hmm. Next up is Hurricane Preparedness Week, May 1st through 7th, 2022. Whereas National Hurricane Preparedness Week is May 1st through 7th, 2022. And whereas Hurricane which are most likely to occur between June 1st and November 30th, produce heavy winds. Torrential rains, inland flooding, and tornadoes continue to pose a serious threat to the residents and the businesses of the city of Palatka, Florida. Therefore, it's important that all residents and businesses be aware of the dangers that hurricanes present and to remain vigilant to lessen the loss of life and minimize property. And whereas residents should maintain emergency supply kits to use at home or during an evacuation with enough non-perishable food and water to sustain people and pets for at least three to seven days. Have a weather alert radio, know their shelter locations and evacuation routes and comply with local authorities when asked to evacuate. And whereas the special needs program provides disaster related evacuation assistance and care for those without other alternatives who will need transportation assistance to the shelter and or have health conditions that require medical attention. Those citizens are encouraged to pre-register through the Putnam County Emergency Medical Services. And whereas the Florida Division of Emergency Management and the National Weather Services and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, have joined together urging all citizens to prepare for hurricanes and to educate themselves on hurricane preparedness and safety and safety strategies. Now, therefore, I tell Little Hill, Mayor of the City of Palatka, Florida, together with the members of the Palatka City Commission, do hereby proclaim the week of May 1st through 7th, 2022, as Hurricane Preparedness Week in the City of Palatka. And we urge every citizen in our community to act now and make ready their families and home and stay alert. And witness wherever I fear to set my hand and cause to be affixed, the seal of the City of Palatka, Florida, on this 28th day of April in the year of our Lord, 2022. I'll entertain a motion. Second. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner Borum, a second by a motion on the floor by Commissioner Campbell, a second by Commissioner Borum. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Let's give a round of applause for Hurricane Preparedness. Um, develop a plan, assemble your supplies, definitely make sure that you have the electricity, the supplies like batteries, gas, medication, water. You don't need to go buy a bottle of water. If you have water on your tap, fill up whatever you can find. Um, get non, plenty of non-perishables. Do not hurt any hurricanes. I will say that a million times. <laughs> Um, you want to hope for the best and plan 
That concludes all of our presentations and proclamations. We'll now move into item four of the agenda, which is public comments. Public comments are limited to three minutes. No action will be taken on topics of discussion. Anyone wishing to speak during public comment, please fill out a yellow, yellow speaker's card. Yellow if you're on the other side of the county. And, and we will go ahead and take care of that at this time. Please, as you come forward, give your name and address so that we can have it for the record. First up is Ms. Lolita Thomas. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lolita Thomas. My address is 2406 Lee Terrace, Polite, Florida 32177. To the commissioners, I come before you um, representing the Family Life Center. Um, I sent a presentation to you all um, last week um, just to kind of highlight the Family Life Center and what um, we have to offer. Um, I know many have seen about the pool. Um, so that's what I would like to um, address today. Um, the facility itself is an 80,000 square foot facility for those who don't know. It's located in the heart of the north side. Um, the facility has two phases. Phase one was completed in 2002. Um, and we do have a second phase that is incomplete at this time. Um, the facility houses a junior Olympic size um, indoor pool. Um, and this pool can be heated um, in the winter time um, that can be used. Um, we want to have that pool available to the community um, to offer it for free, to offer swimming lessons to not only just our youth, but to our adults and all of um, Putnam County citizens. Um, we want to allow the citizens um, who may be getting therapy or who may need to get in the water and do forms of exercises to be able to come out and use the facility in that manner as well. Um, so what we are asking for the commission um, through, whether it's through your opera fund, funds, whether it's through any other type of grant funds or any other budget line item that you may have, that you look to donate us $35,000 in order to get that pool in an operational state that we may open it up to the community. Um, the Family Life Center for those who may not know who are here or who may be looking online, the facility also houses a commercial sized kitchen. Um, we have a large banquet room. There is a gymnasium that is currently open um, to the young men. They go in sometimes, um, open it up and have basketball games. Um, it also, we've had it before to do skate nights. Um, we've done shut-ins with our youth um, in this gymnasium. There's a team center um, that's also available. Um, the restrooms are equipped with showers um, that you know, can also be used. There's office space as well as meeting rooms. Um, so we're able to just to provide this space for families doing any type of need. Um, we know, as we just talked about, hurricane season is coming up. There are definitely opportunities that this facility could be possibly used as a shelter or a place for someone to go um, if in need. So I'm just requesting again to our commission, um, if you would consider um, supporting this project um, of making sure or helping us get the pool open to our youth. Um, to have it for this summer would be an awesome um, idea. We will be running, um, there will be a summer camp ran at that facility during the summer. So this would definitely add to that um, opportunity uh, while we have kids there and available. So again, thank you in advance for your thoughts, for um, your consideration um, in helping us make this a reality. Man, man, can we take this as an emergency item? This is not on. What's your basis for taking this as an emergency item? So the basis is basically what, I, what I've heard and what I've seen in the presentation since they weren't able to bring it to us. I looked over it and basically what they're doing is uh, what we need to do in terms of be able to support um, efforts like that because what we we have a facility a Jenkins facility right now that we're trying to get up and uh, basically it's in the same area uh, we could they could use those funds to help serve 
uh, the community that's in need right now. And, and like in past in past years, the, ki the the kids weren't able to afford the prices that they have. But now, if it's open free to the public to be able to use, uh, that will help immediately give those kids who are um, in dire need of activities among other things to do at, at that facility. And it can serve many different needs from what I'm understanding. So I, I think $35,000 is a drop in the bucket. We've done a number of other things as it relates to, uh, we've, we've given 15,000 to help people with their roof. We've um, given 75,000 for the festival that's coming up this will be something that will be an immediate impact to the community in terms of letting, you know, and, and help in so many different ways. So I'm just thinking along those lines and what is it, I mean, it's just free. In the past, it was fee. So I just see an immediate uh, impact on the community. Probably. I also would like to bring it up as well. I think it's an opportunity um, for us to have the dialogue or conversation that we not necessarily been able to have. I know in the past there have been some um, opportunities or tried to make some opportunities for us to partner with the Life Center. Um, in the past, I'm not sure of what has came out of those conversations. Of course, we were not privy to them. But again, I think this would be an opportunity if we have the funding or if we can find the funding um, to at least engage in some kind of conversation I believe if we wanted it one time before, why would we not want to have that conversation again to see if there is something that we are willing to do? And I may be a little bit biased um, only because that center played a vital part in when I was being brought up. We would go in on Friday nights and we would have skate parties and all of those kind of things. And I would definitely, as a child growing up, literally across the field from that life center, I saw from where it was truly active every day of the week to where it went dormant for several years. And if we have the opportunity to partner with them in some capacity, again, if we have the funding, I would definitely love us, to, I would love for us to entertain a conversation to see what it is that we can do. As stated, summer is coming up. We know during the summer, an idle mind tend to do some, a devil some things, a devil workshop. And again, if we could do something to bring life um, to that facility, because I don't think that she mentioned it, but it also has a fitness facility in there as well. Um, and it's something, it's a holistic approach of what we need, not only in Palaka, but more specifically on that side of town. And I'm in full support of this, uh, creating a partnership with the Life Center. And my key question would be um, entertaining the conversation to see if that's something that we can you know, help fund and support. So appreciate you bringing this to us and asking us. I'm definitely um, looking forward to immediately impacting and helping the community. Thank you. I have any questions. I, I also support partnering with the Family Life Center. It is in the center of our community. Uh, I don't know about the funding, uh, but I do suggest that we look and see how we can partner I did suggest earlier, I don't know. First of all, let me go back to the question. I support it, but the question. Well, I think, so it sounds to me that what we're talking about would be something that would take place this summer, as opposed to within the next two weeks prior to us having another meeting. Um, Ms. Thomas has already indicated that she has a presentation, I think, which will outline what are some of the other things that are out there. If, and so, doesn't seem like time is of the essence from the standpoint that it's something that's necessary for us to do within the next, but in this meeting that we can't do next meeting. So my suggestion would be that we set it, that we put them on the agenda for next meeting, uh, which is the second, which will be the second Thursday in May. That will give an opportunity uh, to have additional conversations. Historically, um, just for so that everybody knows, Chief Shaw, Mr. Cutright, and also I think Mr. Griffiths was involved with some of the conversations that we had in the past in an effort to try to create uh, the partnerships with the Family Life Center. Uh, Mr. Holmes and I have actually 
um, from our law firms, we've actually funded swimming lessons at the Life Center in the past from our personal capacity and our professional capacities. So um, the opportunity exists to sit down and have real conversations about how that could work again before it was $180,000 and it wasn't feasible for anybody to, for us to be able to pay $15,000 a month uh, as related to operating a facility. Uh, but it sounds like there may be some additional conversations uh, which were far different than the ones that started out with both Chief and I uh, before with PAL and, uh, and, and just kind of moving forward and, and having conversations from that standpoint. Um, so my suggestion would be that we uh, have them, that, that we go ahead and place this on the agenda for the May, the first meeting in May, so that we can start to have a conversation um, as it pertains to this particular issue. Uh, because there has to be a budget analysis as to where we are. Uh, there has to be some conversation about particulars as to whether it's realistic and how we get there um, and what's allowable and what's not allowable from that standpoint. And then there are some other considerations that we'll address um, prior to that meeting um, so that everybody's on the same page. And so I, I think those are some of the issues that are there and we can start to deal with those um, in-house and have that set for the agenda as we move forward, if that's agreeable with the commission as a whole. I yielded the floor. But so before we do that, I would like to finish completing my sentence, my Go thought. Um, so in support, and I think that we can move forward with doing a memo of understanding and utilizing the partnership, not stating that we're gonna just give money, but we're actually partnering. So that's a way, that's a way around some of the red tape. I think we could, we could do that. And if we also, and I, I spoke to Ms. Thomas uh, some time ago about maybe we give a portion, housing authority, the county, uh, other resources could be also used. But I agree with Commissioner Borum, $35,000 is a small investment for our community. We put it in and we, are, we will be utilizing it, I mean, uh, we, our police department is using it right now with the PAL. So we're using it, and I'm quite sure we can do a budget amendment and find some money because we just did that, again, for what organization just asked for the Blue Crab Festival to come in. So uh, I'm full support of it. And what are you going to run in, in, in like two months, two weeks? When do you? Well, when you we would really like to uh, be able to go ahead and initiate getting the work started um, so that we can ensure that we have time enough to get the necessary parts in um, so that the work can be done and have it ready um, by June. So. I, do, I do have additional question. Um, and again, I know it's coming back before us, but is there anything that the Life Center is willing to put towards that cause to show that they're trying to meet us in good faith with? Yeah, we, we definitely, um, because once it's, once it's up and once it's running, um, we definitely have to make sure it's maintained. Um, and that's definitely where we would be able to put the money in there to ensure that it's kept up. Um, all of the maintenance, all of the day-to-day um, -day operations for work once we get it up and running. And I, and I could, I can't, I think I could speak on this, uh, Ms. Schenck, about ARPA funds. One thing about the opera funds, it's sort of to uh, make people whole again. So if you had a setback from the pandemic and like the center had to be up and running and the pool had to be up and running, and this is something that we're making whole again, is that correct? And I would like to refer to you to see if this is an expense that we could actually at this time utilize from the opera fund, because she specifically asked that first. But I know we can do a budget amendment, but from the opera funding, I wanna know. Mayor, could I uh, ask a question? I would simply suggest that uh, perhaps when the uh, applicant comes back before the commission that they bring some details as to how the money would be spent how the program would be run 
if they've got some estimates on the repairs for the pool, if that's what the money is to go to, then perhaps those estimates could be brought so that the commission would understand where the 35,000 or whatever amount you decide to appropriate is going to be applied. And then also some assurances about the program, how long it would last, if they've got something set up to, 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 to yes, yeah, sustainability of the program so that you have some idea of, of what the money is going to accomplish. Uh, you, you, you request that of anybody who requests a grant of you and any of your programs that you've got. So that's just a, a, re, a suggestion that I have. That was the purpose of uh, that was the purpose of me suggesting that we wait until the next meeting so that we can start to vet the project. Yeah, yeah I definitely can bring that back. I do have an itemized list of all of the uh, necessary equipment that will be required, um, including labor, um, for the pool to be up and running. So I definitely can bring that back um, to the commission. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Ms. Kitchens. with regards to that is yes, it sir. possible with some of the things that you've mentioned or some of the things that you may know that may come up as regards to concerns that those be um given to them prior to to kind of eliminate some of the back and forth we're, gonna have, we're actually the plan is to have a meeting with them so that we can address the concerns whatever concerns or goals or objectives initially and then bring back a formal presentation that's adjusted based upon those conversations to kind of to kind of deal with those issues from the beginning and also look at funding streams Thank you. and what opportunities may exist. Thank you. Okay, next up, Harold Waller. And so as Mr. Waller comes up, he is the new executive director for the Heart of Putnam. And I, I invited him into the meeting tonight so that he can talk about some of the great things that are going on at the heart of Putnam. And I'm excited about the leadership. processing people, they had to cut off the amount of people that are, uh, they can take now. Our numbers jumped from 400 this month to 800. And uh, I got a feeling we're going to see 1200 again here within the next two to three months, just from the cost of fuel and people not being able to afford uh, food. Uh, so you have an idea on the food. We used to buy food at a dollar a pound. Now we're spending $2 a pound. So, and that affects everybody and we're buying in bulk and everybody else don't get to do that. But what I'm letting y'all know is uh, they've, they've asked me to step up to the plate for this. Uh, when I talked to the mayor, I told him that when I step up to the plate, that means we're not sitting back because no one's heard of Heart of Putnam in a long time. And that's going to change. I'm planning on growing it I would like to make it into something so that when a family comes in, maybe we can get them to the next level where they don't need food anymore. 
where we can get them a job, where we can get them a better job, or where we can get them onto uh, federal uh, funding of some sort with SNAP, so where we can do it all from right there in our facility. Uh, can't happen overnight, but it's something that that's my plan to get us moving along into a better uh, way of helping people in Palaka. Any questions? Any questions or comments? I just want to just thank him for the service that you provide to our community. Only question is, um, the days that you guys serve, I know we have a number of um, pantries throughout the city uh, and county, but I'm mainly um, concerned with, with the city. In terms of the days that they operate or whatever, do we have any that operate on, that not operate on the weekend, right? Epicure uh, is open on Saturdays. Because they went from the long line of people outside on Highway 17 to now everybody has to have an appointment. And so in order to do that, and they could only take 800 families now right. when they did this. So they're open now on Fridays and Saturdays. Okay, good. So the only thing they're missing is Sunday. They have to go to church. Yeah, we, there's some place you can get food uh, somewhere around in the city at some point. All right. I just want to, you know, make sure that they are covered, you know, Monday, is it Monday through Sunday or whatever, to where people have access to food or whatever. We have a lot of food there. I think along those same lines, Commissioner, one of the things that I talked about with uh, Mr. Waller was just his spirit of collaboration with other other entities, uh, including some of the smaller churches and community organizations that are out. Uh, Put, that have food pantries on a smaller scale, uh, being able to have conversations with them uh, and also provided it and to be able to provide additional resources to them. And that was something new that I hadn't heard from anyone as related to collaboration right. as opposed to duplication of services. Right. And so that was something that was one of his key projects was to start to, to truly educate the smaller entities and to be able to kind of be uh, a, a warehouse for them as well, so that as they begin to do certain things, he could help span the resources. And so I was excited to hear that. And um, just to go over and look at the operation work, it was just, it was a work of art. So I, I definitely appreciate you being here. And since we've talked, I've had state agencies now already contacting me with the exact same verbiage that you was talking to me about, about getting us to the next level so that possibly we could start sending food out to different cities in the county so that we become the hub of Putnam County, instead of just us serving Palatka, we can service other cities and let them have the food, have more food. Because right now, no one's pushing food, but Epicure and us, I believe at the at the amount we're doing. Well, what is Epicure supposed to do? Was the one that we're getting food and putting out to and at one point? They're doing it. It's, you got a few organizations that they're uh, including Feed the Eat and some of the others, but there's there's some opportunities there. Also, Mr. Cutright has been working on farm share as well. Right, right, and right. so, um, again, let's give a round of applause to Mr. Waller. We definitely appreciate you being here. Thank you. It's always good to have positive news coming to Palaka. Now we'll move on to our consent agenda. Items A through H. Are there any items on the consent agenda that you wish to have removed at this time? Hearing none. Or... Ah, ah, excuse me. You, you I didn't mean to say that. You move, yeah, you did. You're moving slow. Let's see. Amen. Ah, you got to ah, stop me. I'm moving. But let's pull uh, item yeah. eight. I, got, yeah, I, I go down the F on my agenda. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. No, I got, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, you're right. Okay. You just had a birthday. You just had another birthday. Eight G. Uh, I'm sorry. Five G, and eight. G and H. Five G, and number eight. You're not today. That's all. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, five five G at this point. So far, I've heard F and G. You on F, Commissioner? You, Did you want F? No, 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 no. I was just looking at. Uh, oh, you said you're only going to. Okay, okay. So, are there any? Okay, are there any items besides five G? I would make the motion that we accept the consent agenda as it is printed, with excluding 
uh, number G, letter G. Letter G. So second. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner Campbell. There's a second by Commissioner McCaskill. Is there any further discussion on the consent agenda for all items except G? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 5G, adopt resolution number 2022 R77, authorized execution of a lighting agreement with FPL to furnish, install, and maintain street lights on Mango Drive for a monthly fee of $26.75. Mr. Griffith, before we read the caption. Mr. Griffith, please. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as with our policy, um, this was brought to our attention by a resident. Um, the police department and public works looked at the area, uh, basically confirmed there was a need for lighting in the area. We also looked at the neighborhood and confirmed that the rest of the neighborhood was lit and this one stretch of road was not. So this is at the cost of $26.75 a month, which comes up to $321 a year. So. Um, is that so that is the city because the reason why I wanted to pull it is I know some of those areas are mixed county road city road so is that entire road city road where these four lights are going is entirely within the city yes sir okay great so as commission I wanted to ask a question about how did, how do we identify I spoke to Chief Shaw excuse me uh, recently about lighting and how will we get better light in some of the areas that we're having some of the violence in? And we thought about lighting could be a little help, not a resolution, but some help. Um, and we've had citizens ask about that. So how can we uh, get an assessment in some of those areas, uh, director? So sir, what we could do, uh obviously with input from the citizens and from the police department. I'm sure they know of areas that are not well lit, it may be areas that would be um, good candidates. And we could look at those and we could ask yeah. FPNO or Clay Electric, depending on the service area, to give you a cost for consideration. Yes. Um, FPNO does have a GPS map of all of our lights. Uh, it is a little hard to read, um, uh, but I, my suggestion would be basically just look to our citizens and our police department for suggestions. So it usually is for a street, usually like 26, 75? Depending on the light, yes, sir. And I just, uh, I know we replaced some lighting in the, those areas, and Chief probably gave more, um, but it doesn't seem like it illuminates a lot in, in those areas at night. Um, so just because it was on here, I wanted to pull it for discussion. For us, uh, and in talking with Commissioner Jones, we were, we've were we been identifying the lights and doing the uh, inspections at night and re re responding to City Hall in reference to what needs to be replaced. But one of the questions that was posed and something that we stated was possibly looking at something that would, like he said, illuminate a little bit brighter, uh, maybe a different uh, a light above or a product that, that would light up a little bit a little bit more in the area. Because what we're finding is the lights are, some of the lights are there, they're just not, they're not that bright at all. So would it be, is it, with this contact, would that be Steve Hessler? Uh, no, sir, it's a different contact since we converted everything to LED. If there are areas that um, don't appear to have enough illumination, uh, it's as simple as asking FPNL to give us another contract and specifying a different light. Mm -hmm. We really just need the locations and we can look at the options. So let's set up a meeting. Um, let's set up a meeting to do a, to, to get a listing. So part of what we're doing for us on um, the night shift, we're uh, starting in our, first of all, our targeted areas and going through and identifying those areas that need either new lighting and he'll be getting some soon from just from our walk on Tuesday, but need new lighting or need uh, better lighting. And I thought that was just the question we had and. I'm glad you were able to answer if we can get better lighting and we'll send that information down to city hall. All right, let's do something else with that if it's okay with the commission. Push out a question on your social media pages. Yes, sir. Um, asking um, citizens to identify um, and, and I guess you can coordinate that with Mr. Holmes or Mr. Griffith because he can also do like the survey monkey stuff. Um, asking the citizens, what are their suggestions for areas that may need lighting? And then we can evaluate those as well while we push those out and bring the results back uh, within a couple of weeks. And then from there, um, we can meet with FPL and see what the costs are and bring it back from a contract standpoint. And also um, to kind of piggyback off what Mayor, um, that suggestion, 
Uh, I know that we have um, upcoming meetings with the community. Is it possible for us to have some of that information or some kind of check card that we could have um, presented and get, gain some of that information from those particular talks as well? As far as our uh, quarterly meetings, at those meetings, we will have something in place and I'll make sure we, we have something to identify lighting uh, for that area for the questionnaire. But we also been doing it for our uh, Tuesday, Talking Tuesday. So we've been identifying it through that. So we've been trying to use every avenue we can to not only identify lighting, uh, but other stuff in the area that we can help benefit for the city. And take commission to um, Detective Jones with you as well. He's got a background. Yeah, his, so his background is from insurance to law enforcement. He can work this. <laughs> no, but what I have noticed is once we cross our bridge, dip, their lights are a lot brighter than they are on this side of town. So you hear the public, okay? So, all right. Thanks, guys. Okay. okay. So good, good comment. Now that we have the comment in place, is there a, is there a motion? Don't worry about it. We good. Is there is there a motion? We don't need a caption. Oh yeah. I don't need a caption. Yeah, item G. There's a motion. There's a motion to move. There's a motion to accept item G. Second. There's a second on the floor. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Sonny. Ms. Krentz. Next up is adopt is item number six, adopting resolution 2022 R79, authorizing the contract with ClearGov from the digital budget book for the cost not to exceed $7,750 annually. All right, resolution 2022 R79, resolution is a part Florida authorizing a contract with ClearGov for a digital budget book in the amount of $7,750 annually for a four year term, preventing for scrivener's errors. So moved. Second. It's motion on floor in a second. We're now up on the floor for public comment. Before we go to public comment, Ms. Uh, Ms. Shank, you want to go ahead? Okay, so recently a lot of government organizations are starting to change the way that they present their budget. Um, I'm having Ms. Krantz pull up a video. Um, in our um, DFOA, there's a forum that goes out and actually a lot of entities have went with ClearGov. Now, one thing that's very particular is our actual financial software. So I had to actually do a lot of research with other government organizations that have our financial software. So it, Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I took a lot of time looking into it, um, meeting with the representatives of ClearGov, as well as other governments, specifically City of Ocoee, um, which I actually met them while I was at the ABG conference. They use this digital budget book. And the video um, is just kind of a snippet to show you a little bit of how easy it is to navigate around the digital budget book. It's also ABA compliant, so we wouldn't have to worry about those threats um, and liabilities out there with that. And it also conforms to GFOA standards. So GFOA, as you know, is the Government Finance Officers Association, and the city of Palaka has never received the um, budget book award. Um, it is actually one of my goals, and I hope to actually get that for our organization. It's very prestigious. Um, so this actually conforms with it. So we would be checking off every box to get that award. So I'm gonna let Sunny just play the video so you can kind of see how it navigates around a little bit. You'll notice I'm starting here on the transmittal letter, but I can click through to any of these pages with my navigation bar, which is a modern take on your traditional table of contents. Coming into our budget overview section, we can see that we've created a unique page for the impact of COVID-19 on our operating budget. Navigating to our general fund fund summary, you can see a description of this fund, and then we've got that summary page. One of the best parts of this being a digital budget book is that it really allows you to customize your view as the reader. You'll notice that I can toggle these revenue sources off or on, as well as changing the style of graph I'm viewing to better match my needs and priorities. And again, I can drill down to that account level detail. Let's take a quick look at a fleshed out public safety department page. 
first, we've got that description explaining how we serve residents. Then here's our budget, and this was all done in a few minutes by generating that template and just filling in all of this content. The last feature I want to highlight is the ability to print our digital budget book to a PDF. I can so I do want to point out currently the way that we produce our budget document is actually in Excel. So what happens is I hand key all the numbers into ABG and from there have to turn around and hand key them all into Excel. From there, I have to create the graphs myself. I have to PDF it all in one. Um, and this is City of Ocoee's um, digital budget book actually. And I've, I've sent you all these links as well if you wanted to go back and review them. Um, but my, my hope is that the commission sees the value in this, not only for myself and staff saving time because it's automated. So I literally just send them a CSV Excel file and it automates all of it. Um, whereas, like I said, I have to hand key all of it. City of Ocoee has a budget office of six people and they save three weeks of time by implementing this. Um, you can change it as many times as you want. So if we do implement it this fiscal year, our proposed budget in July would be the digital format. It's a one-time implementation fee. And then of course it's prorated for the remainder of the year. And then we would have this 7750 each continual year. So if this is approved, I've actually um, went back over my budget and made cuts myself. So there would be no direct impact this fiscal year as far as needing to pull from reserves or anything like that. Um, and then it would just be built into the budget moving forward. Do you have any questions about the additional budget book? Will that save on staff? It will save me. You don't have to, yes. we're about to hire somebody else in there, right? Will that save, save on that? We are not hiring someone else. All right. That's yeah, it looked like it might um, for sure say, well, help with efficiency and also possibility of errors. Correct. You're having to input it twice. Mm -hmm. So I think it would help in that respect. I think it's time for us to be forward thinking, and uh, I like the idea. So. I know Lauren likes it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Okay. Thank I'm sorry, Ms. Grants, did we read the caption already? Yeah. We've read the caption. Now for the floor for public comment. Is there anyone here for public hearing? Seeing no one, we'll close public hearing. Any further discussion from the commission? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. You're welcome. Couple turns. Next up, discussion and direction on city-owned vehicle policy. Mayor, previously, as you recall, uh, this item was on the agenda and uh, uh, interim uh, staff uh, in light of the commission wish to provide suggestions to provide those suggestions by email. Some policies that we are changing sort of uh, at our own initiative. Uh, one in particular from the police department, we put out as a directive as of right now, but we'll be changing that to national policy. Uh, in consultation with the chief, I think we come up with something that we believe better addresses uh, what we feel are some uh, considerations. So, uh, so we have that particular issue that we are changing our own or that we are changing from self-initiated uh i guess motivation but uh the, the commission may have others as well chief you want to give a summary of what your change was sure actually uh we've we've already implemented the change for the use um out of county for uh out of city actually out of the city 
um, geographical area. We've made changes uh, for um, pedestrians riding in the vehicle as far as family members and things of that sort as far mark units. We've also uh, put out an initiative to remove the tent off of our marked units with the front windows so we can uh, tear down that barrier. We had some questions about that and where we do agree with the tent on the vehicles and how over time we've had some that uh, we, should, we probably should be removing. So we're gonna go ahead and remove them. Uh, we gave a 10 day notice to get that removed and I believe our date is set for May 8th to have them all removed with the exception of the K-9 unit, the supervisor, and the detectives division. Um, but outside of that, we made those changes. We've also, uh, we're, we've also made changes to, uh, to do away with the uh, air miles and that's listed in our, our policy. And we are in process of um, making uh, suggestions for the amount of uh, distance that it should be in regular miles. Um, and uh, let me see. We're gonna make that uniform with you're gonna do the, the yes, your, your mileage is gonna, you're gonna to try to make your, the mileage uniform for both the city policy and the PD policy. Streets, streets are the closest practical street route rather than air mileage because air mileage is, is uh, no one travels in a straight line by air. So we, uh, we're converting the mileage to a street mile uh, by closest practicable route. Shortest route by GPS. Yeah, that's correct. Close, yeah, closest practicable route. There's two, there, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's, there's two portions in our, our policy that allows for the 10 miles outside the city limits for those who live within that 10 miles. But then we have our detectives, our uh, administrators, and our K9 that are, are on call divisions that we're asking and we're looking at uh, currently at a 25 mile radius. That's the 30, 30 minute window, right? That's correct. Yes, sir. And then on top of that, we uh, changed the policy so that if you're operating the vehicle outside the city limits, then you're um, not allowed to run personal errands outside the city limits. Uh, your travel outside the city limits is to your place of residence and then back to work. And the rationale for all of this is it's just, I think it's based on logic and that is part of the logic of having a take home vehicle is that if you're in the vehicle off time uh, and a call for assistance comes out, then you're able to respond to that call for assistance and it's a force multiplier. But that advantage doesn't exist if you're in Interlochen or Crescent City uh, when you're when you're running air. So our thought was that if we're allowing people to drive the vehicle home outside the city limits, then their travel outside the city limits is limited to going to their house and then back to work again, rather than running errands outside the city limits. I'm not saying anybody is doing it, but I mean theoretically, if you're taking it. If you're taking the, the vehicle home to Interlochen or Crescent City or Greenfield Springs, you go to the grocery store or something or the convenience store or whatever, you're not available at that at that point to to um, to answer a call for assistance on an emergency or urgent basis because you're so far from, from the city limits. So mm -hmm. we made those suggestions to our changes to our policy as well. And it's just and I see the statements to and from home, and one of the ways we're going to make sure that we keep a good audit or a close eye on that is doing our audits from our AVLs, which is our GPS units. Yeah. Everybody will be signing an acknowledgement that they understand that the GPS will be audited on a random basis. And if it shows travel that's not authorized, they'd be subject to disciplinary action up to including discipline and loss of privileges. Now, may I ask a question with regards to that? Is it going to be something that is scheduled or is it going to be random? Because one thing that I don't want us to do is start something and we don't keep up with it. Um, again, I often say we talk about stuff when it's hot, but when it's no longer hot, we tend to forget about it. And holding our, not just <laughs> police department, but anyone that operates a city vehicle, we want to make sure that we hold them accountable and we don't want to allow them to think for one minute that we're going to be laxed on what it is that we've implemented. You will be on a regular schedule periodic basis. Units that are reviewed will be on a random basis because of the project and the time, be targeted. And the time commitment involved. But yes, there'll be a regularly scheduled review, but the vehicles that are reviewed are going to be on a random basis. Thank you. And one of the things we did prior to actually making the change and bringing the policy before you is I did a directive as of yesterday for those items for the window 
and for the to and from and the personal use. I do have one thing that I, I, I noticed that was we, we probably need to look at so the city and the, the city policy and the police department policy doesn't conflict is uh, the items of, uh, or the item where non-employees are in the vehicle. Um, if we look at that, that would eliminate our ride along program. And uh, being that we do have civilians that ride along with the police department, that would actually contradict with what the city policy states. So, well, I think that all those ride alongs should be passed on and approved by the city manager. That'll take care of that because anybody who's in that car will have a file, so we'll know that. Um, and the biggest thing is the liability of a, a passenger ride and something happened and we, we allow before that passing. I, I think that's the whole totality of that. Um, right along an auxiliary, that should be uh, uh, a liability form that's passed along and, and the city manager know who those people are and been authorized. Well, we, we definitely keep a file of it. And I, I do understand that that wasn't basically stated to eliminate, but I did want to make mention that if we didn't add any verbiage or we didn't mention it, that it would contradict. You mentioned 25 miles. That was for the CRT and the... That's just for the detectives. The one exception. Calls. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's correct. Your essentials. Just any other questions for PD as it relates to the vehicle policy? I wanted, while we're also wanted to talk to Mr. Griffith so that he could indicate some of the adjustments that you've made since going back over into the public works side as it related to take on vehicles. So we're still adhering to superintendents who have the ability to have a take home vehicle. And that is because they are subject to emergency on call. Um, as Mr. Holmes kind of uh, referenced, um, it, it is allowable for them to use it for incidental errands uh, on their way to and from work. Um, we do have GPS units on the majority of the public work fleet. You know, we're actually completing an audit now to see if there's some additional vehicles we want to bring before you uh, to add annual contracts on. Um, and those GPS units uh, have alerts that we can set on them. Geofences, speeding, idle times, stop durations. Um, I currently get alerts on my phone, um, and it works well. Uh, it's uh, even better than scheduled um, audits. Um, the only other exception, uh, or not an exception, I apologize, uh, is that the on-call personnel, uh, personnel has use of the city vehicles. So when they're on call for a week, uh, they take the vehicle with them, and obviously they are called uh, for emergencies. So the... One of the things I noticed, and I just noticed this recently, was the tenant windows on public works vehicles. <laughs> Why? Um, comfort. They don't have an AC. AC. Sunscreen. Sunscreen. No, we'll. If the police have to do it, that's all vehicles, I would think. It should be. It should be across the board. Across the board. <laughs> That was one of the things, I, because I, again, I think um, I think the point of it is is that we want to break down whatever barriers we have for communication with citizens, and so if we can create opportunities for engagement, it, it, and, and it's really no different. I've heard um, I've heard from fire from the fire department uh, to public works, people talk about having um, sometimes negative encounters depending on where they go based upon certain factors being in place. And I think any time that we can start to create those more positive encounters and break down barriers um, and engage and engage citizens, then it just works for everybody. And I, I think at the end of the day, if we have uniformity in policy, if we're requiring law enforcement to do it, if we're going to require the airport or even uh, the fire department to do it, then it should be something that's done everywhere, even recreation or whomever. Uh, I, th I think it creates opportunities for us to, to make sure it's all done and it be becomes, you know, a standard as to how we can, we, we put things in place. And, and at the end of the day, it's going to be, it, it reduces the cost. And, and the for the record, sir, I take no issue with it. If it's a standard you want to set, we'll adhere to it. Yeah. And I think Commissioner we consider, um, a deadline, just like we, the police department has already gave us a deadline as to when they'll have theirs removed. I think it should be uniform. Okay. Well, if possible. Yeah. You gave ours a 10 day grace period with the fact that, and it went into effect yesterday, with the fact that knowing that uh, it doesn't require any cost to remove the tent, 
or additional labor to send it out to get it removed. And that's on the front, that's on the front windows, right? On the front, on the front driver and passenger window, that's correct. Where people may transport it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get the logic behind it. Absolutely. But, but I think it's more to just more, it's more so of having the driver engage with, with citizens at some point. And I remember um, even in the past, we had those those policies before, if you remember, uh, when they were required to keep their windows down at some time. I think this, this makes it a lot easier. Any other uh, comments or concerns as it relates to policy? Any other department head that may have a suggestion as well? Commissioner? Well, I know I'm not a department, but I just want to make sure that we take in consideration the um, some of the things when I looked at other cities, what they had implemented with their take home or with their uh, policy as well. Again, those are some things that I submitted and they were put in the comment session um, for consideration of the commission. Okay. Because currently what we have is a two page three, we have a two page document and it's very vague. And I think it leaves a lot of room for um, interpretation. Yeah. Discretion. And again, I think we need to kind of hone down on what it is that we are doing with our vehicle policy. Yeah. Uh, and so I guess from a history standpoint, also something that, you know, we, we have to take into consideration a few years back. Um, and I think Chief can attest to it and some of the officers you had. Um, there was a trend around the state when in, when officers had take home vehicles, you had agencies that were trying to charge the officer for taking the vehicles home, and that wasn't very popular. And it was a deterrent in many ways. Uh, I, I think at some point we look at it, you know, the ability to be able to take your vehicle um, any distance off site um, becomes, uh, you know, it's it's an added bonus for some folks. Some agencies literally um, charge or they or they create income or some incentive for that, that they're taxed on with other agencies. I think the city of Palakka doesn't do that. I think so in itself, it's something that sets us aside from other agencies. But when we look at the cost, the rising cost of fuel and some of the things that are out there, we've got to figure out ways to be more efficient um, so that at the end of the day, uh, we're getting the most bang for our buck and we can make sure we also um, extend the life of ve vehicles we've seen in uh, with Public Works, for example, at one point, you know, we saw some vehicles that were leaving the county and, and going to places historically. Um, those vehicles were on the yard and not even taken home. And so I think Mr. Griffith came in and made some immediate adjustments. Chief's now making adjustments. And I, and I think some of it is just a matter of, of us coming together and, and finding out what the common ground is or how we start to adjust based on the times. Because two years ago, gas was half the price, you know, and and now we're in a different stage and it, you can blow your budget just on transportation as to where we are. And so we have to sit back and make adjustments because we're doing the same things that we had to do in 08 when the gas prices skyrocketed. And so um, all those things become a reality because if not, we'll find ourselves sitting and talking about budget amendments and some adjustments. And for the record, I have no mic Your microphone, sir. <laughs> For the record, uh, I, I take no exception, have no objection to incorporating all of the suggestions or suggested policies that Commissioner Campbell has submitted, but we just wanted to make sure that the commission was good with all of those. There's nothing on here that's radical that I see or that's uh, outside the realm of reason. So we can incorporate all of these. Uh, they're pretty standard. You have to have a driver's license that's appropriate to the class vehicle that you're driving. I mean, just wear seat belts. I mean, there's nothing on here that's uh, that I see is outside uh, the, the realm of what's reasonable. Yeah. Is it, you know, just the main thing and what I was concerned with just, you know, the liability piece with life, health, and safety when you have either ride alongs or family members or whoever may be in the vehicle, um, the, the, the city vehicles. Um, I just, I just, you know, just really make sure that we're adhered to what you know we are covered i know other cities had it i know crescent city had it. and i know the um, school district also had the policy as well in terms of how you utilize your vehicles with um or, or a 
whatever it may be. So it's it's in line with what I think is is good and right and proper. So all the transparency and accountability. Clear go. Also, um, once we take effect, once whatever we decide um, is taken into effect, how would we disseminate the information to ensure that those who operate those vehicles are fully aware of um, the new policy that has been implemented? It would be my suggestion um, with any change of policy that I've said on various boards that once they are given that information that some kind of document is signed to ensure that they are in no, um, just in case anything comes up in the future that they you have a signed document that you sign with regards to the new impl impl implementation of the policy. So, so we're gonna do, so I, I know the PD has a policy, they're, they're signing acknowledgements. Um, and so it looks like everyone's gonna be signing acknowledgement on the new policy as it's put in place. Um, and is that something that's going to be done through HR uh, as a part of and adopted through the handbook as well? We'll so. push it to the department heads and let HR coordinate that. Okay. Thank you. That's what I was asking, Ms. Jones. I'm sorry. So, um, and so that piece is in there. So as it relates to where we are tonight, do we, do we want to go ahead and have a motion at this time or do we want to have a final draft brought back to us for approval at the next meeting? I would make the recommendation that again to give them the opportunity to to have or if they would like to add but again I, don't, I wouldn't want us to rush into a decision tonight is that going to be enough time or do you want the end of May okay, okay. Uh -oh. all right so I'll entertain a motion to uh, I'll entertain a motion to continue this until our first meeting in May so move second motion on the floor in a second all in favor say aye aye Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much for your work on this and for the adjustments that have already been made. Excellent work. Next up is item number eight, adopt resolution 2022 R69 to adopt the purchasing policy effective for 28-22. I will say this before we get started for sake of time. There are some I have some some serious concerns as it relates to some of the language in there from a legality standpoint, um, because one of the things that we want, as it relates to um, part of it is making sure that there is a requirement for disparity study on some of the language. Um, so I would ask that this item be continued for 30 days to provide enough opportunity to do that. Excuse so, me, and the reason I'm asking 30 days is because we're looking at implementing this as a part of the budgeting process so that it's there so that if Technically, our effective date would be at the beginning of the fiscal year, correct? You're looking to have, well, you were initially, you were asking for the 28th, but it's something that it's, as we look for effectiveness, it's truly something that's set for budgeting purposes. It would just be effective the day that the commission approves it. All right. So that would be my only, my only suggestion. And, and I, I think there's some, there's some things from a legality standpoint. I just want to get with counsel and make sure. Um, that we cover. I don't know if anyone else had any other concerns that they wanted to address as it relates to this item um, to put on. I, I would say second meeting in um, May, just so that we can make sure that all the, the I's and T's are dotted. I talked a little bit with Ms. Shank about some of the concerns. Um, didn't have an issue with the concept, but just making sure that from a legal standpoint that we were covered. Once we close out this, I have some concerns. So at this time, I entertain a motion to table. I'd like to make a motion that we um, table item eight, the um, purchasing policy uh, to the second meeting of May. So I second that. Motion on the floor, second by Commissioner Jones. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Mayor, if I may. Yes, sir. I have a question, and it's just a general question, being that we are taking <coughs> policy. Um, are there any other policies that we as a commission need to have brought before us to either take a look to see what we can do to change them if any changes are needed? Um, I know since my time sitting on the dais, um, we haven't had many uh, policies and procedures to come before us 
and I've been sitting here for almost eight years. And if we've been sitting here for almost eight years and some of our policies have not changed until this recent, I believe that we as a commission have a due diligence to look at some of our policies, to look at some of those other things to make sure that they are where they need to be with time. When I say time, where we are today in today's world. So I would make a recommendation of any policy that hasn't been updated within the last 10 years that it comes before the commission or be brought for us so that we can take in consideration so that again, we can make sure that we are up to speed when it comes down to policies and procedures. And that we need to periodically just amend that and we need to periodically do, I guess, a, a policy review, um, how many ever, you know, every two years or three years or five years or however, so we don't get so far behind on policies. So also on, on that same line, I think one of the things that the manager has talked about and has actually started working towards is looking at some of the HR policies and, and reviewing those. He's talked to council uh, as it relates to that. You want to go ahead and give him like a quick update on where you are? Well, we're going to be So that, uh, you know, as we talk, I think it's a key thing. Uh, ultimately, the city is going to be responsible for the policies that are implemented by the police department as well as all other departments. And um, over time, for whatever reason, I guess there's been some, some uh, policies that haven't really been run past the city commission by some of the different departments, which are then trying to remedy at this point. And so we're looking at all of those and bringing them eventually to you uh, uh, for uh, your review and adoption uh, uh, by basically by the department. So the personnel policy across the board is going to be presented to you. We're updating that. That was part of what we paid for with the uh, salary compensation study, if you recall. And so you'll be bringing the personnel policy to you in full then specifically with the police department procedures and also disciplinary policy that you would be bringing. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then also, I, I think, and this is something I was going to mention later, and your mic's not on, and, and just so, <laughs> and, and also, she's, almost, she's, she's so much different on Zoom, right? Yeah. So also something that I was gonna mention during my report, but I'll go ahead and mention it now along those same lines, Commissioner, is charter review. Uh, yes. it, there's been a long time since we've had a charter review. Uh, so Ms. Kitchens, how long has it been? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna, well, we're gonna fix it because it's got some broken pieces. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna look at we're gonna look at the charter review and see uh, if there are areas that we need to that we need to look at. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we put together a charter review committee to look at some of the things that are there, um, so that we can so that we can see what we have in place and go from there. I know there are one or two things that we have that we've already talked about that we need to look at, um, but I think it's time for us to do that. And periodically we want to look at it. If it's not, if it ain't broke, we ain't gonna fix it. But if it's broken, we're gonna fix it so that it works that way. And I think that's the same thing we do with our SOPs. And so uh, we've got new lenses from people like Mr. McNair uh, who were here, Ms. Jones. And so there's an opportunity for us to, to be able to advance our community to the next level. And so that's where we're, that's where we're gonna look at and go if that's okay with the commission. And I'll bring back a recommendation for us to look at the charter and see if there are places that we need to adjust. And so, any comments from the commission as it relates to those things? I echo those same sentiments. And then the last part of it is, as we look at what we've got in place, we've always had the position of vice mayor, uh, which has kind of been in place um, through Mary Lawson Brown for many, many years. But if you look at our charter, it doesn't exist. And so those are ways that we can start to make those adjustments through charter review, because at the end of the day, if the mayor is absent, then we don't have a formal process for someone else to take over. Uh, at that point. So those are places where the, the charter is silent and we need to adjust. And so those are some of the things that are out there. Um, and so we'll move forward from there. Uh, for the sake of time, we will go into, 
Item number nine, which is public hearing to adopt resolution 2022-R80, first reading. Do we formally uh, move to the and the meeting of May? Yes, the second right, meeting of May. Second meeting of May. Ms. Kranz. Sorry, one second, sir. Resolution 2022-R80, a resolution of the City of Palatka, Florida, red designating Brown Hill area within the City of Palatka, Florida for parcels 4210-2768-50-500-0021-4210-2768-50-0500-0020-4210-2768-50-3017-2790-400-0030-3008-0 and the submerged land parcels A, B1, C1, C1, and F within the city limits of Palatka for the purpose of environmental rehabilitation and economic development, providing for effective date and providing for Scrivener's heirs. So moved. Second. Let's motion on the floor by Commissioner Campbell, second by Commissioner McCaskill. I've never heard that many O's been said at one time. <laughs> We're now open with Mr. Gr Mr. Griffith. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just going to give a brief background on this. Uh, if you are <coughs> in December, uh, we advertised for the first public hearing of a citywide brownfield area designation. It is a local area designation. Uh, which is prescribed by statute. Uh, the legal advertisement went out on January 7th uh, for the second public hearing. We held the first public hearing on January 13th. Uh, as you're aware, uh, it failed to pass. Uh, we then came back to you on February 16th um, for a discussion and direction on the Wilson Cypress Cove as a site-specific opt-in designation. As you may recall, it was advertised as an opt-out program originally. Uh, we sent out letters to every single resident, uh, did uh, pretty much everything we could do. We gave even more time than what was required by statute uh, for noticing. Um, and we got a lot of feedback. You know, a lot of people did not want to be included in that area-wide designation. But Cypress Mills, uh, during this process, uh, the agent for that property did state that they wanted to opt in. Uh, you then directed staff to go ahead and proceed with the first public hearing. That's where we are tonight. Uh, just to go over some of the benefits. Um, simply, this is an area-wide designation. It doesn't confirm that there's any contamination on the site. Uh, the owner of the property uh, would have to confirm that there is eligible cleanup activities. They would then enter into what's called a BISRA, or a Brownfield Site Remediation Agreement, with the state of Florida. And they could be eligible for voluntary cleanup tax credits uh, up to 500,000, job bonus tax refunds up to 2,500 per job, and refunds on sales and use tax paid on building materials for qualified home affordable housing or mixed use affordable housing projects built on sites within the area. Do you have any questions? But those, but those are those are possibilities, not guarantees. Correct. Sir. This is just a first step towards eligibility. Correct? Yes, sir. And and from this point forward, it would essentially be, the onus would be on the owner of the property to move forward. Yeah, the only thing we have to do if you approve at first and second hearing is transmit to two different state agencies and then it is on the owner of the property. We've got Mr. We got Mr. Bingham on the, on Zoom with us. Uh, Mr. Bingham, are you available? I am, thank you. And he's the record agent for the owner on this property. Uh, you have any comments? No, Jonathan actually did a great job explaining all the benefits. And again, once, um, if you guys do decide to approve this, then it's my ball to carry forward. Um, I have retained three different lawyers that are um, experts in this field and they will assist me in actually doing the BISRA and getting all the paperwork forwarded. So this is just, again, as I said before, another tool in the toolbox. <coughs> Any questions or comments from the commission? All right, thank you. Thank you. At this point, we'll open the floor for public hearing. Is there anyone here for public hearing? I have you fill a card out for me at the end. Florida. I have no objection to the Brownfield designation on the legal descriptions as included in this resolution. 
But I have a question, um, as the project has apparently now included more property than was originally shown to be on the planning board meeting, it, which is why the planning board uh, meeting is, is gonna be tabled on this. Does the, is that gonna automatically include additional property in a legal description that doesn't show here? Is this the only thing that's in a brownfield or is this going to be expanded to include the rest of the project that he's put in? Well, he'd have to notice what he has in place before anything else would take place. Okay, so this, this brownfield is fine on what it is. And if he has to do it, if he has to add any more to it, then it'll be another. You have additional notices that public notices that would go out be the 30 day notices two additional notices okay, that will go great, out. Okay, great, because I have no objection to this. Uh, it is an industrial waste site. It is toxic. There was an environmental study done in 2003 uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency of Florida on Florida furniture. So it is definitely, this does definitely, I think would qualify for it and it will need to be cleaned up. So kudos to the developer for looking into cleaning it up before he puts people on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> is there anyone else here for public hearing? Mr. Mayor, did I, I did my ears deceive me that she, the commissioner, did Miss Commit Kitchens actually give kudos to a developer? She <laughs> did. Uh, yeah, it's in the record, trust me. All right. Seeing no one else here for public hearing at this time, we'll close public hearing. Any further discussion from the commission? Question. Questions, call all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. First step down. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next up, City Manager and Administrative Reports, Mr. Holmes. A couple of brief notes. This is an informational only comment. Uh, as you know, the Palakka Housing Authority has traditionally paid a payment to the city in lieu of taxes. That uh, speaks for itself. They don't pay taxes, they pay a payment in lieu of taxes. Last year, I believe that payment was $18,000. This year, they reduced it to $10,000. So their payment in lieu of taxes has gone down by about 40%, 40%. We have asked for an explanation. Uh, I don't think we've gotten a complete explanation as of yet, but I wanted to give the commission a heads up that, uh, that, uh, that, that contribution from them or assistance from them has, has gone down. You tell them that everything but in isn't the world there, is going up. So. Yes, but isn't... Um, <laughs> But pilot is a statutory calculation, correct? It is, uh, there, there is a statutory formula. There's an agreement, sir, that we have with the uh, um, housing agency. Right. And in that, it includes the pilot payment. Um, and in fact, the, the number of units that were included in that agreement is less than what they presently have. And so. Um, and, that's, and that's where the payment um, was, uh, scat, um, schedule was established. So with the profession of the commission, um, either Commissioner Jones, who is the PHA liaison, or myself, um, can we go ahead and coordinate something with the manager and council to meet with PHA? I also want to have, I, I think there's an opportunity for us to have a joint meeting with PHA. We talked about it. Dr. Woods was okay with that, but I think it's time for us to have that meeting. Also, so that we, since we're on that conversation, uh, they're also moving forward with RAD. They ranked a developer for the RAD program. The last conversation I had with him last week, and this is news to me, um, is that we he wanted to have the, the commission involved uh, in the conversations as it related to where they were moving forward with RAD to make sure that there was some concert uh, with the city. So um, with the commission's permission, we can seek to schedule uh, a joint meeting with them as well um and just kind of let me know what your thoughts are as it relates to that mayor um i know you made the suggestion that you um or um commissioner jones but i think at this point i think we, they, we need to just bring them before the commission second yeah. um because i think the conversation um there may be some thoughts that we may have that we would want to have put out there as well and I'm all for having that liaison, but I think at some given moment that we just need to bring them to the table so we all can have a conversation. I, I agree with you. And I would like for them to come out and explain what that RAD program is for the entire community. So it may have to be like to the Price Martin um, where we had a capacity. Any other comments from the commission? Okay, we'll make it happen. Okay. Then uh, next, uh, 
wanted to recognize one of our own, Ms. Shank, is uh, going to be graduating soon with her master's degree, very soon. Master's. I think that all of you encourage all of our staff to continue to improve themselves through their education, and I think Ms. Shank's a good example of that. She'll have her master's in public administration, is that correct? Wow. And, uh, and you're walking when? What day? Next Saturday. Next Saturday. So I wanted to give her a, give us a chance to, uh, to recognize her for that achievement. Hmm. She can be a seated manager. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so it's it's gonna be a great weekend. So I walk on Saturday, Sunday is Mother's Day, and then Monday is my birthday. Make so, sure you at work on make sure you at work on that's a, that's a pretty nice move. <laughs> I, I have um, my dad is actually coming in from Texas. Um, and then my brother's flying in from Colorado. He just got back from deployment, so they'll both be here. Thanks. Congratulations. Congrats. Congrats. And nothing further. You sure? I will mention one more thing. I'm oh, sorry. So, <laughs> so just so you know, we almost have the ability to go home at a decent hour. So let's put that on the record. He was just in a meeting early with the Blue Crab where he had four final questions. It's not unusual for me. I uh, want to mention that we had a pre-pre-meeting with the fire union. We're about to get into union negotiations again. And so we'll be scheduling the first meeting with the union um, for the purpose of kind of seeing where what their demands are, how far apart we are, and then deciding how we're going to move forward with negotiations. That's all I have. Anything else in your final comments? Not yet. Council? No, sir. Mr. McNair. Ms. Jones. Just a couple of things. First of all, um, April 23rd, this year, no, two years for the city manager, then city manager here at the um, city of Palatka. Um, we've had three in-house promotions here at the city. Ms. Pappas moved from accounting clerk to grant accountant. Ms. Fuller from HR coordinator to accounting clerk two. And Christopher Gaylord from a refuse collector to the facilities labor position. Um, we have three new hires that are coming on. Ms. Latanya Thomas will be our new customer service representative. Mr. Leon Hubner, our mechanic trainee at the wastewater treatment plant. And Mr. Gabriel Johnson, an operator trainee at the wastewater treatment plant. Where are we with the uh, sanitation? Not sanitation, I'm sorry. Oh, PW Public Works person. Where are we with that? Huh? We still have interviews. We have four applications current um, two in and two out, um, two in house applicants and two outside sources. So we have to do the interviews. We're working. You know, the come. Comments or questions? Mr. Griffith, where are the boats now? Um, <laughs> Mr. Cutright. Of course. Two minutes, please. <laughs> Slight reflection. Right. I want to fill out that yellow comment card. Uh, <laughs> now, I just want to bring a couple of things. <laughs> Next weekend, we're doing a, a farm share giveaway at Texas again. So uh, we're actually asking for volunteers, not mandatory, but if you come out and help us support, we appreciate it. It'll be from uh, eight to when we run out of food, it's that Saturday, so we can, and actually she's gonna bring a couple of Mother's Day gift packages to give away too, so we'll give some of the staff a thumb and then some of the people that come get the food. Uh, we're trying to do a quarterly food share with the, well, a quarterly form share uh, joint venture, trying to make sure we keep everything going good at Jenkins in that area. Uh, in uh, recreation, uh, we're finishing up soccer, uh, and it's going pretty well. And we're going into the promotion for baseball as we speak, uh, and trying to do some creative things with that summer camp. <coughs> Commissioner Jones at Fairfield with a couple of ideas, so we're looking at funding them on those. And uh, in code enforcement, as we know, we're proceeding uh, pretty good and about to go get ready to go a little proactive on some areas that we literally need to hit. Uh, so. Other than that, does it? That was less than two minutes. And the uh, food truck is tomorrow, right? 
Yes, Food Court Fridays tomorrow. And that'll be the last one we do at lunchtime, starting in May, it'll be the evening event. Yes, um, on the uh, farm share thing, whenever that goes out, I know it was suggested by um, a community member by <coughs> getting the word out to people who don't have transportation, like the el some of the elderly people, uh, getting food to those uh, people who are also in need. So, okay. Yeah, and what, what we did last time was we kind of transported some of that to some people that needed some help, and we're going to do that this year if we can get some support from the fire department and, and hopefully the police department. Uh, one, one, one caveat to that is fire department, we, I want to apologize up front, and you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're going to reach out to those that need help. I know because um, Commissioner Jones, brother, I just want to kind of put that out there so we can make sure we accommodate. May I ask this question? is Ms. Hope. Where are we with um, the system that for Jenkins that is supposed to be, what is it, the sprinkler system? Where are we with that? We're waiting on the governor to, yeah. we're waiting on the governor right now to sign the the final budget so that the allocation of that, the, um, the, the funds will, will come in. And the only reason I <clears> asked <throat> that question, I want it to be on the record because of course, a lot of people have now started to um, ask and more recent with some of the, the break-in or whatever, the vandalism. Um, I think that is a tribute to not having any real activity going on over there. So. And to add to that, we met with State Touch and a couple more security companies to try to put something out there to kind of give us a little heads up. But as you just said, until we act, occupy the building, it's not going to stop people from really trying to get in the building just sitting there. Yeah, and so that's not. And last, this is my final, final, final statement. <laughs> uh, the Blue Crab we met, <laughs> we met yesterday with the Blue Crab and everything's going on point for having a successful program. Me and Chief Shaw was talking back there a few minutes ago, and we're thinking this is going to be probably one of the biggest ones we had in a, in a long time. Because the young lady is doing a wonderful job, and she got some nice headliners, and everything is coming in place. Good news. Thank you, sir. Chief. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to commend Eddie on his shirt on uh, National Firefighters Day and recognition. <laughs> May 4th. Uh, I provided uh, a report for the Pastors and Police Alliance uh, meeting we had as notes from the meeting, just so you are aware of what occurred, uh, what was discussed, and our plan uh, to have the next meeting on the 16th, on May 16th. Uh, we will be having the meeting at 823 Hudson Avenue, uh, and it will be at 6 p.m. Um, I also provided you um, date time for Talking Tuesday, uh, so that uh, hopefully to help with attendance and Talking Tuesday, get some enthused. I know I've had a number of you asked about uh, the next event, so I wanted to make sure you had that the schedule of events and times and the location, so I provided that. And from the last talking Tuesday, I provided you a spreadsheet of things that we got, uh, <coughs> requests we got from the citizens, issues that we that we uh, heard, that was told to us, uh, actions that was taken, that we've done uh, thus far, and what was referred to the other agencies. Um, we will be, we have begun going back um, and seeing and ensuring that uh, some of the things were done. Uh, the time frame with a lot in a month, it gives us time to go ahead and make those corrections, um, uh, reassure that they've been made and that the referral, if they're going to refer to other agencies, get with them to see what they got it taken care of, and then get back in touch with those citizens to get feedback on what was done. So that's our reasoning for the, the month between talking Tuesday. We've uh, done that. That's the list for you. And uh, thank you again to Commissioner McCaskill for attending, helping out. She was a big hit. Your quarterly, your, your quarterly meetings, how did that one go? Court, the quarterly meeting is, is rescheduled to next Tuesday. On the back, you'll see the flyer for it. We handed out flyers for it. We did not want to push. Uh, we, we felt that uh, two things. One, we could not get the venue um, reserved in time to, to get the information out to where we could make sure we had a successful event. So we asked one of the reasons why we pushed it forward. We, we scheduled a new a venue. 
and <coughs> push it out on social media, send it out to uh, Commissioner Campbell's request to send to get a hold of it so he can get it on social media as well. But we hand deliver flyers in the area to all the residents. Thank you, Commissioner Roof, or Bo Commissioner Bourne, in reference to volunteering to assist. And I attached a flyer to your packet as well. Yeah, I ran across my uh, <laughs> Black of Police and Churches Against Violence shirt. And unfortunately, it's still the same size. You I, um, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you on that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave that in Eddie's shirt. I'm going to put them both together. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, 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 since you mentioned that, I actually think it will be a good idea uh, uh, for us to look at um, doing something fires. similar. Uh, for this group here. And we're going to be meeting again. Uh, but Captain Williams will be chairing that meeting because uh, I won't be in town for that meeting. But um, I think that's something that is, um, it's, it's developed into a, a great program. Although uh, in our Talking Tuesday, and it was a close uh, to the, the first meeting, our Talking Tuesday, we only had Chaplain, I'm sorry, Pastor Mulberry at the meeting. But I have received conversation from some other chaplains since then and saying that they will be in attendance. And my hope is that the attendance and um, not only from the chaplains, but from uh, a lot more of the community uh, members, as well as um, citizens and uh, employees attend as well. Is there a way that with those Talking Tuesdays, of course, while we would love for citizens to all come out, a lot of citizens don't have the ability to come out for whatever reason. Is there an email address? Is there um, something that we can solely dedicate on our website, on just something additional outside of those Tuesdays that encourage? Because a lot of the stuff when I'm looking in here, so, most of it is like anonymous. So um, do we have where people would be able to report that? How can they report that? Do we have a telephone number that they can call and give their um, ideas and remain anonymous in doing so? Like what other steps can we take in order to make sure that there's a variety of ways for citizens to be able to be engaged in the Talking Tuesdays? Well, a great question. And we began talking about it uh, just from some of the information we received from the meeting is uh, establishing also in our quarterly zone meetings, being able to provide cards so that we can fill out different things so they can report to us. Uh, Captain Newcomb had some other ideas and I'll let him uh, explain that. <coughs> in the Talking Tuesday meeting that we had last week, um, we talked about, and I just have not had a chance to implement it yet with IT, but we are looking at doing a Talking Tuesday at palaka-fl.gov and posting that on our flyers so that if any citizen has something that they would like to send us, that we get it. We have several different uh, at palaka-fl.gov emails for different city groups and stuff. So the idea behind that one was that that comes to me and Captain Williams because we're team leading that program. And then we can add it to our list, address those issues with other city departments or whoever it needs to go to, and then respond back to that person. That was one of the ideas. And in keeping in such to make sure that we are following what we, we, are, we set out to do, the report from each talking to the, like this one has been presented to you, will be presented to you on what we, we received and what action was taken. Any, any questions, comments? Chief, I would like to commend you on the uh, pass along. That has been a uh, good source of communication, uh, at least to, to me in this commission, I believe, and it kept us informed, and I appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Uh, I just want to commend you for all of the efforts you guys been doing has been excellent. I know you guys were doing some of that work prior to some of this, but uh, thank you for sharing what y'all are doing to help um, advance the community. And you uh, forgot one point today here. You've got a special guest that you might want to say something. Don't forget that. Uh, as you all know, my uh, real boss walked in as I was told. <laughs> My real boss walked in um, in support. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's uh, she gonna be time for to dinner home. and uh, she wants to go to dinner. So I think she's happy that we might be getting out early enough to go to dinner. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead and leave now. We got to hurry. Chief. 
Let's wash. Let's shank. Ms. Krantz. Nothing, sir. Thank you. Time is now 7.20 in Alabama. You forgot, Mr. Mr. Ewell. I've already gone, Mr. McNair. <laughs> Anything else you want to tell me I miss? I like the boots. <laughs> I love the boots. Since you volunteered, you're up first. Oh, um, we have officially started accepting applications for the City of Palaka Youth Ambassador Program. Um, it was presented at the last commission meeting. Thank you all. Um, and it's out on the streets and we were actually getting inquiries from other schools that are within the city um, that desire to have students. I know we, um, Mayor Hill and I went out to the boys ranch on Sunday, had an awesome time um, connecting with a, a lot of community organizations um, and more specifically with the directors of the boys ranch. It's always a good time every time I go out and just to see the, the, the young men that they have coming through and how respectable they are. We also, we also look forward, and I told Sonny um, just prior to this meeting to extend an invitation to some of the guys that are out at the Boys Ranch to be a part of the program. And the, deadline. the deadline is the 29th of May, 27th, 27th of May. Um, and if anybody wants the application, feel free to contact Sonny. It's also posted at the city's website. Yeah, she created a Facebook page. I mean, not Facebook. Uh, yeah, she created it. <laughs> That's all, man. Commissioner Jones. <clears throat> hmm. Go ahead. Now move, move. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Sister. Say thank you for my sister to come and support the city of Palakka and what's going on here. Uh, Bernice Johnson is my sister. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boer. I have nothing further, but I just want to just thank the staff for the uh, most excellent job they've been doing. We've doing quite a few things and just across the board. So I just want to thank the staff for what they're doing and also the commission Mayor, for what, what we're doing to help advance this, this city. That's all I have. You sure? Sure, that's my. No, I got you. something. No. No. <laughs> no. Um, in closing, I, I'll say this. Um, I've said it over and over again. There's a need for a public information officer in this city. Uh, with the things that are going on, we can't, we tell our story better than anybody else. And if we don't start to tell it, and Chief's in the back nodding his head, if we don't begin to tell our story, other people will tell it for us. Um, in light of everything that's happened over the last few months, the reality is we're working, we're getting better. And it's continuing to improve. And I think people see efforts and they see efforts that a lot of folks miss because we don't tell our story properly. So if we're not going to get a PIO, then we need to train somebody in-house to do public information um, from the standpoint that we are sending messaging out regularly. You just heard about 10 programs going on with the police department. You've got things from recreation to what goes on with this commission. And there should never be a comment that there's nothing to do with Palaka because there's always something to do. But the reason most people don't get it is because we haven't maximized the approach. If you look at what's going on just with Facebook now with Blue Crab alone, there's something continuously out there. There are more people talking about Genuine and Little Texas than anything else in the world, but they should also be talking about Talking Tuesdays or the Mayor's Challenge or soccer or, or softball, what's going on at the airport, the fly-in, the hiring, all those different things. And we have an opportunity to reach the masses. And if we don't take advantage of it while the iron is hot, we're gonna miss the boat. No pun intended, Mr. Griffin. So, um, but there is an opportunity for us to truly get more people engaged because it's not just social, it's not just Facebook, it's Twitter, it's Instagram, it's personal contact, it's using all the other resources that we have in this community, and it allows us to not duplicate services. So let's strike, let's strike now. Let's look at the opportunity for public information to be a vehicle. 
And I think every department would be willing to take a few dollars out of their budget so that we never find ourselves in a situation where somebody else walks in here and tries to tell us what we're doing. And so that's what this is all about, is the city taking control of its own narrative. And if we do that, then we can begin to tell about the successes in this community and about the citizens who are contributing on a whole different level. And there's no other time than now. And so that's my comments for tonight. And his last comments are? Um, we're paying positively <laughs> platinum uh, about 9,000. That could be a, another vehicle avenue. But yeah, again, that's a good point you made about a, a PIO. We would not have to be reaching out to other agencies to do that. So we're paying them about 9,000. Positively Putnam is an opportunity, but what I'm saying is having a resource in-house that allows us to be able to do it on a regular basis. Even when it comes to creation of flyers and promotions and all this other stuff, the police shouldn't be pushing their own information from the standpoint of having to create the flyer, having to do the other stuff. We should be able to reach 50,000 people by punching a button. We will create a job description this week. <laughs> Only if the commission wants it. Well, it's only re I want to get out of here before 8 30. Um, so it's only really reiterating what has already been stated because, again, nothing against what has been put out, but then again, you have people who specialize in those type of things, which would alleviate um, whoever is doing it now to be able to do more of what they're supposed to do with regards to their specific job. So it's, it's only going to be for the benefit of the city and our respective departments. And I, and I think it's already been created. It's, it has, if you check the system, it's been created. It was there um, a while back. It, the position, it was created when um, Shanahan was here and they had actually started interviewing. And so it may be a template in there already um, for us to look at. And I think it's just a matter of sitting down and trying to figure out where we are. We're getting ready to go into budgeting anyway. Yeah, it was it's the there. perfect time to have that conversation. Yeah, I said we'll to, create to something this week. Yep. So that's where we are. I, I'm excited about everything that's going on. I appreciate all my department heads uh, for the work that you're doing right now. Um, all the staff, uh, city manager, um, and this commission. We, at the end of the day, um, we could have fell apart, but I think more than anything else, we we came together. And so uh, your, your, your character is tested by what you do in crisis. And so um, we are, you know, we're resolute. And so we're, we, we're not timid. And so we continue to move forward. And so the gym of the St. John's River continues to shine. And I'm, I'm excited about what the future brings. It's festival time. So bring on genuine.